In today's show, we discover a rare triumph, not formerly the property of a famous TV detective. Alex Robertson's Triumph Roadster is one of around 4,500 built in the late 40s and is quite possibly the most immaculate in the United Kingdom right now. This is my Triumph 1800 Roadster, which I bought in June 2003. This car was first registered on the 21st of May 1948. It started life in Lytham St Anne's and seemed to have spent most of its life there. Uh, it then moved down south where uh, it went off the road in 1975 and finished restoration in 1991. I, I don't know uh, the history of the full restoration, although I have photographs, um, but uh, the fact that the uh, painting or restoration was finished in 1991, uh, I surmise that uh, the television series of Bergerac may have something to do with the change of colour back to maroon. Uh, I think that the original restorer uh, must have been a coach builder because of the condition of the bodywork, but unfortunately I think he preferred to sit and look at it because the car had not run. <laughs> um, it had done a thousand miles from restoration uh, when I bought it. Uh, I've now put on 6,000 additional miles in the time that I've had it. Uh, but it did take me the first six months to get the mechanics something like right and still improving. <laughs> uh, nearly everything has been done over, replaced, whatever, uh, and now it's just about running right. Well, why I bought this car, um, the story is that I, I took my wife to Paris for the weekend. Uh, the flight uh, coming back from Charles de Gaulle Airport uh, was delayed. Uh, and I went to the uh, newsstand for a magazine, newspaper, whatever. Uh, and uh, the only thing I could find that was in English, because I don't speak French, uh, was a classic car magazine in English. And I thumbed through and thumbed through, and uh, a lot of adverts at the end, and one locally for this. Um, I uh, thought about it overnight, as we eventually did get home, and the next morning, on computer, I printed out a copy of the photograph. Uh, I also printed a copy of a photograph of a rather rubbish other classic car and went to my wife and said, which one do you prefer? <laughs> and naturally, she said this. I said, get your coat. <laughs> and we went and bought it. When I bought the car from a dealer, he took me out on a trial run um, and wanted to reverse into a side road to turn round to come back. Um, but he couldn't find reverse on the car. I had done some thoughts about the car and uh, knew where reverse was, so we had to change <laughs> over while I reversed the car into the side road, not being insured by him, uh, and then he took over again, which was rather embarrassing. Uh, but uh, as I say, it is always my practice now to park the car nose on to something because nobody will find reverse. <laughs> I, I picked it up from Chapel End of Frith. My brother-in-law took me down in his car uh, and uh, we set off to come back. Uh, the uh, uh, dealer selling it to me had a great deal of difficulty in getting it to start uh, but eventually managed it and it was coughing and sputtering and he said uh, oh, it's only because it hasn't run for a while. Yes, yes. Uh, so we set off uh, with my brother-in-law behind me uh, and kept looking in the rear view mirror and I thought, why is he falling back? And eventually he was about half a mile behind because he just couldn't stand the fumes that it was pushing out from the exhaust. <laughs> uh, black smoke, fumes, petrol, uh, nearly every nut was loose on the car. <laughs> um, so it needed a fair amount of work. The first few times that I drove the car uh, it was obvious to my wife that my shoulders were up. I was very tense and very irritable um, because it is an extremely difficult car to drive. Uh, as with most old cars, doesn't really like hills, <laughs> tends to slow down a lot. <laughs> There's rarely a summer weekend when Alex isn't out attending events or taking part in rallies in his roadster. 
and as a former official of the Standard Club of Great Britain, Alex is also pretty knowledgeable about its history too. Uh, the car was produced in black, as the vast majority were. Uh, the alternative, it was black with um, grey interior, uh, and in another, I think there were only three colours, grey with a grey interior, uh, and maroon with a red interior. So this is the, uh, one of the original choices, although this car started in uh, black. Uh, since then, it has been uh, green, white, and back to maroon. <laughs> uh, that I know by when the paint flakes off, <laughs> you find various other colors. The Triumph Roadster uh, retained the name of Triumph, although the company had been bought by Standard at that stage. Uh, Sir John Black, who ran Standard Motor Company, um, gave the job uh, towards the end of the war of producing the new model, as I've said. The model is known as the uh, Roadster TR. Uh, it was never the TR1, as some people think. Uh, this was the TR. The uh, Triumph then produced a model in the early 50s called the TRX. That was a complete flop. Um, cost far too much and uh, manufacture was delayed. Um, so they then started on what was known, coded in the, man, uh, the uh, company, as 20TS. Uh, 20TS was known by everybody who worked on it as the TR1. Um, but when it was finally produced and marketed, it was called the TR2. Uh, that moved on. The Triumph Roadster uh, was produced from 1946 um, with the 1800 engine, 1776 cc, uh, overhead valve system, which uh, Standard had uh, manufactured. Standard used to produce engines for a lot of other uh, car manufacturers, uh, and Standard had produced this engine for SS, as it was known, now known as Jaguar, for obvious reasons for the war. Um, and uh, uh, it had been developed as a 1.5 for Jaguar, but opened out to 1776 cc uh, for the Roadster. Um, of the 1800, which they uh, started production uh, in 1946, uh, there were 2,501 produced. Uh, then in 1948, late 1948, Standard were developing the Standard Vanguard, uh, with a 2 litre engine, 1991 cc, and they changed the engine in the Roadster to the 2000, it then the model became known as the Triumph 2000 Roadster, and they produced uh, very nicely exactly 2000 of the 2000 model before production ceased in 1949. The car was not produced in uh, great numbers because basically it is a pre-war design. Uh, manufacture of it is uh, basically uh, designed around what was left over after the war effort. Uh, the chassis is tubular steel which was used in aircraft. Uh, the body is Burma bright aluminium apart from the front wings which are steel because they couldn't get the shape uh, in uh, aluminium and it wouldn't have been strong enough to support uh, the full weight of the flowing lines. The uh, production method was outdated. Uh, you've got Henry Ford uh, on a pr long production line where everybody did little bits and all in steel and metal. This is still on an ash frame with the Burma Bright body. Uh, it was an expensive production uh, method, T uh, timely as well, couldn't produce it in quickly in, in enough numbers and at the end of the day was rather expensive uh, and the car uh, in uh, late 1949 was uh, priced at around £900, uh, although it had started at 770 I think it was, somewhere around there uh, when it was first produced in 1946. Uh, but Ford were producing for just over £200, which made this a very expensive car and not really something that uh, the masses could afford. Uh, marketing of this model of car uh, was put in the sales brochure uh, and advertised as a five-seater tourer. 
Uh, one has to remember that people were smaller in those days, <laughs> fortunately, um, because it, has, uh, it is fitted with a bench fit seat across the front. Uh, the uh, gear lever is on the column uh, on the right hand side so that the driver doesn't disturb his middle passenger and the handbrake is an umbrella type on the right hand side. Uh, the rear of the car is developed into two dicky seats uh, to take the two additional passengers making the five I've always wondered about uh, the uh, idea of touring with five people in the car because there is then absolutely no room for any luggage. They might have managed a toothbrush if they bothered with that in those days. Um, the dicky seats uh, are of course pre-war design and this was one of the last cars ever to produce with dicky seats. Uh, entry to the dicky seats is rather difficult. Uh, on the rear bumper there are two rubberized steps provided uh, but then one has to clamber over the boot lid uh, and remembering that the sides are aluminium so you can't lean on them otherwise you dent them. Uh, but once in uh, it is I am told very comfortable. I, uh, I am the only driver of this car so I've never travelled in the dicky seats. Uh, my wife has and describes it as very comfortable, feels very secure uh, and I have had my uh, stepfather in who's six foot one uh, but we did have to pull him out under his armpits. <laughs> he couldn't make it out. <laughs> when I, I uh, go out with my wife uh, driving this car and we love, you know, on a nice sunny day we love to just go to the pub for, or whatever for a drive round, uh, although it is used mostly for uh, road runs with clubs and uh, for shows. Um, but uh, one of the things that really amuses us is it's not so much middle-aged people, but not interested in it. Presumably XR3Is or something would uh, be their fancy. Uh, old men just stop and stare, and young children shout, nice car, mister. <laughs> uh, so they do appreciate it, and that really makes us feel good. We like to take it to shows. We like people to look at it. Um, when I first bought it, it was uh, in virtual concourse condition, the bodywork. Uh, now because I drive it a fair amount, I've got little stone chips at the front and uh, scratches down the side where somebody's gone past with a pram or a bike at a show. But uh, I still prefer to use the car. I prefer to have fun with it rather than just sit and look at it. I remember seeing the car uh, as a child with, uh, with a friend of my mother's. Why I particularly liked it, I don't know. I think it probably was a childhood thing where this was a soft top and she arrived always with the hood down because it always seemed to be sunny days in those days, as kids always remember. Um, and uh, I just liked the look of it. My father had always had saloons, sit up and beg saloons in those days. Uh, so I aspired to it. I love the front end, the headlamps, the uh, two horns, the grill, um, and just the flowing lines of the wings uh, repeated in the boot. Um, there is a story about uh, that that wanders around with the Triumph uh, Roadster that uh, uh, it was d designed uh, towards the end of the war uh, when it was realised the war was ending and uh, they'd have to return to car production. So the design is still pre-war um, and the story was that uh, Standard Motor Company who had at that stage bought Triumph uh, gave the job to two people, one to design the front end and one to design the back end and then they put the two together. That's not actually strictly true. One man did design the whole car uh, but that was design on paperwork. Um, the design was then given to two men, one who did the coachwork for the front and one who did the coachwork for the back, and they are always slightly different. Uh, all the cars have been hand built, so the flowing lines here change here, and uh, on other current uh, cars that are still in use, this door can be one and a half to two inches wider than on mine <laughs> uh, because they're all hand built on ash frame, Burma bright body, steel front wings. The driving experience is uh, quite unique. Uh, 
Um, you set off second gear, the torque is not good enough to set off, even on flat. Going downhill might be alright, so you do need first gear. But first gear will take you up to five miles an hour. <laughs> the top three gears do have synchro mesh, but being an old gearbox, uh, the synchro mesh doesn't really work any longer. Uh, you do tend to have to double the clutch to uh, be able to uh, match the engine speed to the gearbox speed. Such as that. <laughs> And then have to wait carefully to go into third because it, it won't take it then. <laughs> the car runs quite well uh, and stays up in traffic, keeps up with traffic quite easily. Um, but one has to remember that uh, braking is not of modern standards. Um, it can be, prove quite difficult. Uh, you tend to leave a gap as happens with lorry drivers, you leave a gap so somebody overtakes and jumps in the gap and you have to fall back again. Uh, so it is a continuous thought. But, uh, the, the steering, uh, despite the weight of the car, which is just over one and a quarter tonnes, uh, the steering is quite light, mainly because of the size of the steering wheel. Uh, most of the weight of the car is on the front, but it still steers quite well and it was designed to go to 80 miles an hour uh, originally. I've not had this one up to 80 miles an hour. The fastest I have been is 70 and uh, that was a, a little bit worrying because the uh, brakes are not absolutely fantastic uh, when compared to modern discs. We tend to travel motorways 60-65 uh, reasonable A roads, 60, um, keeps up quite well. Fuel consumption is quite good at around 25, 26 to the gallon, so not too bad. Probably a thousand miles to a couple of pints of engine oil though. As with all old cars, the engine tends to leak oil um, and one doesn't need to worry about rust underneath the car because it has a good coating of engine oil. Uh, driving at night can be somewhat difficult. Um, as you can see, the headlamps are rather large. Uh, they do have a dip mechanism, uh, which changes the angle very, very slightly. Um, the uh, bulbs are 55 watt, which are not very powerful, but because of the size of the reflectors, uh, anybody coming towards me tends to think I've got main beam on uh, and keep flashing me, but there's nothing much I can do. When I originally got the car, it didn't have the um, spot and fog lights. Um, and I bought those uh, because shortly after purchase, uh, we went and stayed in the Lake District with some friends uh, who have a Triumph Roadster. Uh, and they said, let's go out for a meal, follow us. And we set off down a dual carriageway and everything's fine. And then he turned left and uh, the road became single track, no lights, no street lamps, uh, trees right up to the side of the road and very windy going up a hill. Um, he has a TR2 engine in his roadster and has uh, halogen lights fitted uh, along with spotlights. So he carrying on at 30 miles an hour up this hill um, all I can get out of my headlamps are two little pools of light about four feet in front of the car. Uh, so naturally I'm going up to about five miles an hour. Uh, so that was quite hairy. So uh, at the next uh, show, restoration show, I bought the two period uh, lamps um, and fitted those in with the main beam uh, and can now see quite some way. Uh, the hood has always been either black or grey, uh, but uh, grey doesn't look right to me. <laughs> um, the paint in those days would be cellulose, and this has been resprayed in cellulose. Uh, cellulose gives a harder paint finish, um, and therefore you can produce a better gloss. You can still get cellulose, 
um, but you're not allowed to use it on cars any longer. Uh, the interior of the car, uh, I have some history from the uh, photographic record of the restoration uh, and it's obvious that uh, the seats had gone completely. So uh, the seats have been completely reupholstered, including the dicky seats, and the interior has been recarpeted. Uh, the original colour uh, from manufacture was maroon outside, not of this car, but uh, was a choice, uh, and red interior, and that's the way it has been produced. The seats and dicky seats are all leather, um, and still in quite good condition despite the 7,000 miles um, but I prefer them to look a little creased I prefer them to look used but we still have all the original tools the jack uh, which jacking points at the front and rear into the chassis uh, the starting handle uh, hand pump which still works and connects well and the wheel brace and on the other side is still the uh, original greaser for the uh, water pump which has to be greased every 200 miles. It was common before World War II for cars not to have a very good starting system uh, because they ran on a 6 volt battery. Um, so most cars were fitted with a starting handle. This car still had one despite being 12 volt. The starting handle can be very rather dangerous in use but uh, I'll demonstrate its use on this car. A nice little flap to open up to uh, enter the starting handle which goes through here, through at the back and then connects into the engine to turn the engine over. One of the problems with that is that the engine can turn backwards which kicks very violently and breaks your thumb so always get hold of a starting handle like that and then you turn the engine over like that. The instrumentation on this model uh, originally the uh, speedometer was on the right hand side and on the left hand side are three dials one for petrol one for oil pressure and one for water temperature. Uh, they have been turned round when this car was restored and I agree with uh, the person who did that uh, because you cannot see in the driving position the speedometer. <laughs> uh, your hand on the steering wheel obscures the speedometer. Uh, you may have noticed that this uh, model has three windscreen wipers. Uh, quite disconcerting but of course it was sold as a five-seater tourer so three people sitting in the front. Uh, to turn the windscreen wipers on is a little bit difficult with a four-spoke steering wheel because the only way to do it is on a straight stretch of road to put your hand through the spokes and to press and turn the wiper on until it engages onto the bar which runs right across the front of the vehicle. This being a, a three-seater bench seat uh, the vehicle is supplied with three wipers so for the middle one you have to get this in timing with the other one and push it in and then the same with the third wiper and then you have all three wipers going independently in the days when the car was produced there wasn't much traffic around so you could take your eyes off the road quite easily but doing it now is quite difficult because you have to actually time when you're going to drop it in, otherwise they'd just crash. <laughs> yeah, you can run just two on their own, um, but it uh, looks very funny. Rain is a particular problem with this model, uh, particularly if you were to travel uh, with five people in, uh, as the sales brochure says. Uh, the two people who sit in the dicky seat uh, the rear boot area is uh, in two parts opening and the front part is in fact a windscreen, a split windscreen for the people in the back but there is no hood for the back. So it works quite well providing again you're doing more than 25 or 30 miles an hour because the rain goes over the top of them but when you stop at traffic lights 
they get wet. I provide them with an umbrella. <laughs> the um, car has appreciated in value. Just of late, uh, this particular model has become quite desirable. Uh, and I would always recommend ownership of this particular type of car to anybody because it is a usable classic. Um, I don't think you should put it away and just look at them. Uh, definitely use them. They are not too valuable, uh, just valuable enough to make it worthwhile. I particularly enjoy owning this car. Um, it gives me a lot of pleasure. I have always uh, had a leaning towards being a mechanic, uh, despite the fact that I ended up being in an office for virtually the whole of my working life, apart from a period in the Navy. Um, I enjoy working on the engine, I enjoy working on the mechanics, and I enjoy going to shows. Um, I would never sell this car, and in fact there is a saying in the classic car world that uh, you might change your wife, but you'll never change your classic car. Um, right. <laughs> Oops, could be trouble brewing, so let's leave it there. The Triumph Roadster was never a big seller, and in a cash-starved Britain, a country that had just won the war but was about to emphatically lose the peace, an anachronistic tour that cost getting on for a thousand pounds was never going to set sales records. Search for the Triumph Roadster online and you'll find Alex's car on Wikipedia. It sets the standard, mechanically and bodily. Constructed from what was left over from the war effort and, as the story goes, designed by two people who didn't seem to communicate much, the Roadster was not well received by some contemporary commentators, one referring to its shape as more toadster than roadster. But time has been kind to the Triumph, and the flowing wings and suicide doors mask its shortcomings well. Now we can look back at it and smile. And no matter that its design harks back to the 30s, and its mechanicals weren't that much more advanced, it's all a very long time ago. What a beauty it is.